There we go. So uh, welcome everybody to the 2020 PJSA online conference. Uh, we're glad to have you here. And um, my name is Jeremy Rinker. I teach at UNC Greensboro in Peace and Conflict Studies, and I'm going to facilitate today our conversation, and I'll introduce the speakers in a second. Just a couple of um, housekeeping issues and announcements of things. Um, at the end of the at the end of the talks, we'll have some time for question and answer. If you would prefer to ask your question yourself, you can certainly just put a question in the chat box. If you'd prefer to use the chat box to ask the question, you can put it in there as well, um, and I can try to facilitate asking the questions that come in through the chat box. Um, uh, if nobody, if you don't want to be recorded, we are recording this event. So if you don't want to be on the recording, you're welcome to close out your camera and um, and just have a picture up or have your name up if you'd like that. Uh, you have the ability to change your name as well if you want to do that. Um, I want to announce that that so this is we're getting close to the end of the restorative justice section of our three month long virtual conference. Um, October is on storytelling and peace building, and November is on polarization. If you want to participate, and we highly would recommend and hope that you will, if you want to participate in, the, in that part of the conference, you do need to go on and get another ticket. Um, the ticket for September only works for September, so you're going to have to go on and, and re-register for tickets for, for both October and November. I think November's not up yet, but October should be very soon. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear to people that the link that you have is not going to work uh, for stuff starting in October. Um, also, I want to just put, put the plug in as the institutional liaison to the board to, to if you're at an institution, a small or large institution, and you'd like to do institutional membership, reach out to myself or Michael Lodenthal, the executive director of PGSA. Uh, we're, we're looking to increase membership. Oftentimes our conference time is the time when memberships do get both individual and institutional memberships uh, rise. And so we're hoping to use the conferences as, as a way to help that along because we're not in person to do that kind of work. Um, so I just want to encourage you to go to our membership link on our website and, and join in. Um, the last thing I'll say is that, and, and this I've been meaning to say this a lot of times at the beginning of our of our conference proceedings here this month of September for restorative justice. Um, the the one of the the affiliated journals with the PGSA is the Journal of Transdisciplinary Peace Praxis, which I edit, and our call for the fifth issue is actually on healing and justice. And so I want to encourage people if they're presenting here, if they know folks who do this type of work. We're, our, our deadline for abstracts is passed, but quite honestly, the, the, the issue won't come out until uh, February. So we still have time. If you've got a manuscript that you think would be useful, feel free to send it to me. Um, you can also go to our website and look there. Um, I'll put the link to the call in the chat box as the folks are speaking, if, if anybody liked. And, and some of the speakers on today's panel have already submitted for the, for the journal, so I appreciate that. Um, so that's all I have in terms of announcements. Uh, if you do have questions during the time or if you have technical issues, Jacob uh, Ostacher, I don't know if I say your last name right, Jacob is, uh, is one of the co-hosts and our kind of uh, intern from uh, American University who's helping with uh, any technical issues you might have. If you have questions, you can float them to me as well, um, either individually or to everyone on, in the chat box. Um, Having said all that, let me go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. And our, our, our panel is entitled Participatory Action Research with the Roots, with the Restorative Roots Collaborative. And so uh, Rochelle Arms Almengor from John Jay College of Criminal Justice and her colleagues William Evans from Neighborhood Benches and Nicole Levon Smith, from, uh, who's an independent RJ practitioner. Um, are going to enlighten us on their work together, and uh, we look forward to hearing what they have to say. So I'm going to, without further ado, pass off to Rochelle. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. And welcome, everybody. Good to be with you this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to just take a moment to 
share screen. And um, we are looking forward to sharing about our work together today. Is everybody seeing that, the uh, intro slide there? Okay, great. Yeah, so um, the three of us belong to a larger group of a total of eight practitioners in restorative justice who work as part of what we'll be telling you about today, the Restorative Roots Collaborative. Um, and uh, Nicole and William stepped up with this opportunity so you'll be hearing a little bit later about their background and experiences. Um, but before we do any of, of, of that, we wanted to start today's session with a land acknowledgement. Um, so if you'll just take a moment to, um, we're all in different places right now and just to, to recognize um, the place that you're in and and whose land you're on in this moment. So we want to acknowledge the people whose lands we stand on at this time, indigenous communities who were dispossessed of their rightful lands and subject to slavery and genocide at the hands of Western colonialists. Though we all normally live, the three of us in, live and work in New York City, right now we are in different places. I, Rochelle, am in Kentucky in the traditional lands of the Cherokee and the Shawnee, among several others. Nicole is in Brooklyn, New York, in the traditional lands of the Muncie, Lenape, and Canarsie. William is currently in South Carolina, the traditional lands of the Cherokee and Congaree. We recognize that there are over 5 million Native Americans in the present United States, and we honor their communities their suffering and resilience, and their service as stewards of the land. And we stand in solidarity with their present day struggles for justice. Um, and just as a, as a group, uh, it's important for our work, a lot of what we do is around these conversations and bringing, bringing us back to the roots, right? Bringing us back to the origins of where practices came from. And so collectively, we want to also encourage you to, um, to do these land acknowledgements before your events, if you're not already incorporating that, just as a way of honoring um, who came before and the violence that was inflicted in the process of getting to where we are today and the pain surrounding that. So there are a lot of tools for that. There, these are a couple of uh, examples of images that you can download where you can insert the name of the, the people. Um, hey, how are you? Hey, I'm doing okay. Good, uh, um, the traditional owners of the land, um, wherever you may be having your event. So thank you for taking that time. Um, so we're gonna uh, talk first about sort of the origin of this project and what was the the, the spark for it. And it started, um, it's definitely a project that started through experience and practice. Um, myself, I have 20 years in the restorative justice field and conflict resolution work, a lot, a lot in mediation, community mediation, and a lot in the criminal justice arena. Um, but I started in restorative justice in college really through a practicum as part of a um, a class um, as part of my religion major that was looking at moral exemplars. And I did a, a kind of practicum with a group in Philadelphia that was trying to increase clemency by incorporating restorative philosophy as part of their arguments. So that's when I first came into contact with it. And then I was lucky enough when I um, came home to my home state here in Kentucky um, to, to work, you know, find, find work. I, I connected with a restorative justice organization that was doing work in medium and maximum security prisons, and we delivered seminars. And, and since then have 
have, you know, it was, it was a time when it was little known and definitely in a more socially conservative state like, like Kentucky, it, it faced a lot of challenges. Um, but it's, it's been part of my, my personal and professional trajectory for the last 20 years. And over that time, I observed a, a number of, of challenges, but more so in, in the recent years, now that restorative justice, as you all know, having heard about it throughout this week, um, has become a bit of a, a bandwagon. And, and so there are a lot of people jumping on that bandwagon, a lot of people who are getting trained um, and then immediately going out and doing the work. Um, and there's just a lot more demand for both the practices and, and the trainings. Um, and so one of the problems that I would say in relation to that, that, that I certainly observed and I knew in talking with my colleagues was an experience that a number of us were having collectively was that RJ or some people refer to it as restorative practice practices is is really an ancient idea that has now been packaged as new and commodified in ways that jeopardize the integrity of the work. Um, I don't think this is necessarily unique to to our field, but given that restorative philosophy has a real um, emphasis on values and on walking the talk, and there's a lot that the, the whole philosophy really does hinge on accountability in many different forms. Um, it's something that was difficult for me to see in, in, in settings, especially where uh, there were new, new trainings and, and branding and um, you know, materials created in order to sort of sell restorative justice and, um, and have it as another, um, a, a, as another practice in our pocket that we could you know, whip out and, and, and be able to offer clients. Um, and I work a lot, a lot in the nonprofit industrial complex uh, who are much more guilty of this kind of thing for, for understandable reasons. There are limited resources and everybody's trying to get a piece of the pie. But sort of one of the casualties along the way, or certainly injuries, has been that from our observation, restorative practices are very often divorced from the sort of way of life from which they came. Um, and then second to that, though not less, less important, the thought leadership in RJ does not reflect the majority of its quote unquote clients. And I say clients because that's how they're often regarded through organizations that do RJ processes um, in, a, in, a, in, in nonprofits and other organizations. And it doesn't reflect the majority majority of, of the people it, it serves basically in criminal justice arenas and social service organizations, uh, nor many of its frontline practitioners. And I think this is especially true in urban settings like where William, Nicole and I work in New York, uh, where overwhelmingly the people who are doing the front lines work, who are in the schools, who are in um, the agencies doing uh, direct services, are people of color, um, black indigenous people of color um, who are not mirrored in the people who research this work, who write about it, nor even in the people who train. Um, and so here's a good opportunity for me to just step back and say that this is actually just one half of our project. What you're hearing about today is the New York component, but there's another component based in Guatemala, which um, simultaneous to me thinking about these things, I connected with a colleague who was working with a new restorative justice collective down in, in Guatemala. And they uh, were facing, you know, newer along in their path, but having similar questions because they were trained by a very established American organization that really does well in offering many trainings and 
all of these things that we're talking about in terms of co commodification and packaging is what they introduced to the Guatemalan practitioners. And from their perspective, that was restorative justice because that's how it had been introduced to them um, to the extent that they were even required to use the, the materials in order to do the work, um, that they had to sort of sign on the dotted line about commitment to, to using just that brand of materials. And so there was inherently a minimizing of both the indigenous knowledge that was already there, given that restorative practices are ancient practices. It's um, very, they're very human practices. They're things that we do with our children. They're ways of living that all of us have to some extent in our small communities or families. And that as far as we see it in the Restorative Roots Collaborative, they don't belong to anybody. And so it doesn't, um, it, it isn't in keeping with what they're trying to do um, to sort of put, put them into these forms um, that are part of um, the nonprofit industrial complex or other similar types of systems. So I went about in talking with this colleague in, 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 in Guatemala and in also talking with colleagues in New York, wanting to convene um, folks. I was already working in participatory action research with mediators as part of my doctoral work. And I'm really committed to participatory methods of research um, in the same way I'm committed to restorative justice as, a, as an approach to living really. Um, in the sense that the people who are affected by the research, I, I think is very important that those people be involved in, in directing the research about them or that affects them. Um, just the way that people who are affected by harm in restorative justice are the ones who are included in making decisions about how to mend the harm. And so I put a call out, um, this is the first part of a letter that I sent out to my networks in New York, um, asking folks to be part of a co-learning team is how I phrased it. Um, I was looking for approximately 10 practitioners to work in parallel with our sister group in, in Guatemala. Um, and that we would be doing this way of research where participants function as researchers themselves with support from an academic investigator. That's not always how PAR works, but this is how I introduced it, given that I was based within a university and had to go through all of the, um, the hoops that some of you know very well and getting permissions um, to do research. And finally, I let them know the topic of research would be decided by the participants. So the idea was basically that we would come together and talk about what mattered to us, what seemed relevant in terms of the concerns that people had about um, their work at this time, and that we would collectively choose what to study. And I saw myself as also another practitioner because I have been for so many years um, also speaking from my own experiences and practice. So we had a few goals at the start of this project. One was um, this, this was, you know, that part of that original impetus that I had to do this was to amplify underrepresented voices, specifically Latin American and US minorities. Um, raising them to the global conversation about restorative practices and their transformative potential. So this is um, a priority that we have for this project is that um, we, we aren't uh, recycling the same voices as important as those voices have been for pioneering the field in the United States and Europe and other Anglo countries. Um, uh, you know, the Kay Pranises and the Markham Brights and the Howard Zares, we know that the practices are so much broader and so much more diverse now after uh, some decades of their use and application in many different cultural settings and that um, it's, it's high time that we hear other voices in that thought leadership. 
um, and then to start an international exchange of ideas, resources, and tools for restorative practitioners. In part, especially thinking about the Guatemala group, it was important um, for me as part of connected to this first goal as well, that we inform the practices um, multi-directionally, right? So that we're not just exporting these ideas from Europe and North America to the global South, but the, that the ideas are really in mutual exchange with each other and that we're hearing from practitioners in Latin America and other parts of the global South who are able to inform us about what they're learning and growing to be experts in. Um, and then just simply and, and quite generally to improve the use and teaching of our practices. So the actual topic that each of our groups decided on is that, you know, is, is an effort to improve on the practices that we're using through a reflective practice in a collective and um, the this you know social construction of knowledge that happens when we when we bring people together. So we came together in New York for the first time on October 12th, 2019, so almost a year ago. Uh, we met at John Jay College. There were eight of us, and the same group remains today. Everybody stayed with the project uh, from the beginning and is still quite committed. Um, we, uh, we met initially on a monthly basis, um, but this first meeting was a day-long meeting that was really to set the foundation for our learning together. Um, we uh, learned about participatory action research, what it is, why the approach is important, especially for practitioners learning uh, about their own work. Um, we learned about reflective practices, which is a kind of method in order to a systematic way of learning through your own practice, um, a way of becoming more conscious of why you do what you do, learning to ask particular questions of yourself, which is really important in these conflict resolution, RJ, basically a lot of the helping professions where there's um, there's solo work, there's a lot of solo work. And so it matters that you have a way to self-assess, self-evaluate. Um, but we we're doing that um, together. And then toward the end of that first day, we also started to a brainstorm and workshop some initial questions that were important to, to us as a group and found that actually we had a lot of questions in common and a lot of experiences in common. So. Um, what I had required in order to participate and the process to recruit was some, something I can talk more about later if anyone is interested, but, you know, I really mainly wanted to bring together people who identified with an underrepresented community. So we have people of color, we have gender nonconforming, we have somebody who is um, the daughter of an, of an incarcerated person. Um, uh, we have Latina identifying, Black identifying. So there, there was um, really that was sort of the main requirement that, that you would be approaching your, your learning about restorative practices from the point of view of your positionality as somebody who at times has been underrepresented in the depictions of the field or in the leadership of the field or in who gets the contracts, et cetera. Um, so, um, in addition to, to just setting the foundation about all that we were going to do together and, you know, this paperwork with consent forms and things, this first day really mainly served for us to get to know each other um, and, and to start to build the trust necessary to create a safe enough space for us to really delve into questions that brought a lot of ourselves forward. Um, and our vulnerabilities as well, um, and to have that safe space. So we conducted this meeting in a circle, as you can see in the picture, a restorative circle process um, to make sure that everybody's voice was heard throughout. And, um, and, and, and we were 
using this basically as our jumping off point for subsequent meetings. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there and then I'll pick back up telling you more about the evolution of our process and questions later on. But um, but right now I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole and William to tell you about their background in coming to this work um, and what orientation they have to restorative practices and also to talk about um, uh, what their priorities are in this work um, as relates to to doing a project like this so um, so I'm just going to stop share now and uh, turn it over to Nicole to introduce herself. Nicole, are you ready? Okay. Good. So go ahead. Are you unmuted or do I need to do something else? Oh, got it. I okay. couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> um, thank you, Rochelle, and thank you, PGSA, for, for having us here. Um, so just a little bit about myself and my experience. Um, I come to restorative justice work following a 20-year career as a New York City um, educator, um, though I do believe that once an educator, always an educator. Um, the heart of my work was with youth in schools and was always, in, in my opinion, um, work around liberation and justice. Um, it was kind of at the heart of everything that I taught and all the programs that I ran and all the initiatives that I started. Um, and really when I got tired of feeling limited in my ability to affect change and to, um, to really speak truth to power and to, to ignite the sort of change that I felt would be most meaningful and most transformational for young people. Um, I started to look for, I guess, different outlets um, and ways to delve deeper into just liberation work. Um, I honestly don't, I can't really pinpoint my entry into restorative justice, but um, I know that that was kind of like the impetus to, to look for a space and a, um, kind of a framework that allowed for deeper engagement in liberatory work. Um, so in coming to restorative practices and restorative and transformative justice, I just really was able to quickly recognize it as a way of being that has always spoken to me um, and that holds ancestral and, and generational meaning and connection for me. And um, the idea that it's, it's really limitless in terms of its scope and reach. So what I bring to the work is um, a lot of my own frustrations and pain of living in an unjust society, um, but I also bring a fierce love for my people and for humanity and the belief that, that we can all do better and that this world can be better for all of us. Um, I come to this work as a writer and as a storyteller and as a lover of the griot tradition and the way that stories heal and unite and clarify and foster introspection. Um, and that that element of storytelling is something that I really value deeply about my work in restorative justice and kind of the overall restorative justice framework. Um, so I guess more specifically, the work that I do, I, I utilize restorative practices um, tools and framework like circle facilitation and conferencing, um, affinity groups, coaching, training, um, all with the goal of building and strengthening relationships and supporting individuals and communities who are seeking justice and, and healing harms. Um, 
I center anti-racism and racial justice within my work. Um, so it's always kind of at the heart of what I'm doing. And um, I hold space for brave conversations that assist in building accountability and shifting culture wherever, really wherever people are and wherever people are sharing space and in community together. Um, I would say that my positionality in the work is, is being Black in America, um, where being on the receiving end of justice is a constant battle. Um, I consider myself a community member and a member of a large variety of communities, um, many of which are underrepresented, underappreciated, under-resourced. Um, I'm a descendant of healers who were and, and are uh, eternally powerful, abundantly blessed, um, undeniably gifted, and my positionality is also just in, in being really present within the work and actively engaged as both a participant and a facilitator, um, knowing that it's my, my right and my duty to do this work. Um, so I'm, I'm aware of, I guess a, a lot of awareness, especially right now within the work is of entities um, who are in the forefront of the work who present um, entities in the forefront of restorative work that take pause in my and other practitioners, um, particularly practitioners of color, um, kind of centering of racial and social justice within the work. Um, and the argument that the work should, should somehow stick to a safer version of SEL, socio-emotional learning. Um, but in my world and in my work, I, I don't believe there's separation between SEL and socio-emotional needs um, and social justice. They're all really deeply intertwined and um, intentionally and explicitly addressing and fighting anti-Black racism and systemic white domination is, is key for me within this work. Um, so when I talk about communities, I would say that my communities encompass so many different people. Um, they're educators, they're leaders, innovators, healers, artists, creatives, um, and then also I guess the idea of folks who, who others deem or label unreachable or too broken or too angry or just outside of the realm of being able to help and support um, to kind of bring into the fold. Um, I really, I guess based on my, my work in education, I have a deep love for uh, working with young people, but I also love working with people just in general, um, people of all ages. And I would say that my community is people who, who believe in justice and liberation and black indigenous people of color who have been disproportionately impacted by um, the nation's injustices. And my community is Bed-Stuy Brooklyn and all communities like Bed-Stuy Brooklyn um, my community is Caribbeans in America and Africans in America, and I could go on and on. Um, so I'll stop there in terms of my communities. Um, and just in terms of my relationship with the PAR group um, and all that Rochelle kind of explained and, and laid out, the PAR group has been really meaningful for me in terms of being in community with practitioners who care for and are deep in service to communities and who support both my individual but also our collective kind of inquiry into the roots of restorative justice um, stemming from those of us who tend to be underrepresented underrepresented or um, relegated kind of to the background within the fields um, 
it's been really reaffirming in terms of claiming and reclaiming our space within this work and in allowing us to step to the forefront um, confidently and our process as um, a PAR group has been about ongoing introspection in service of the work and the work that we do in communities specifically. So I'm really grateful for, for the group. Um, um, I'm also looking forward to, to really kind of engaging on a deeper level with the, the Guatemala side of the group. Um, and their findings and, and their kind of questions. Um, and I, I don't really, I know there's an end, there's supposed to be an end to this work, to this project, <laughs> and I'm not really envisioning that happening. I think that we've all created something that's gonna be ongoing um, beyond the scope of the, the project, um, just in terms of, again, that, that support and that kind of affirmation and that community that's been built. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's been a really invaluable kind of resource for me in a way that um, no other kind of restorative justice practitioners community has been. So I'm, I'm grateful for it. Um, and I think, I think that's it for now. Thank you, Nicole. Yeah, so um, so it was important um, to ha have you meet, you know, some of the folks besides um, besides me in this project, and um, to to speak from their own perspectives because we all sort of came into this with with some really strong similarities um, and also some really important differences. Um, so William, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, I'll turn it over to you. So how you guys doing? So I'm William Evans. Um, I'm the founder of a nonprofit organization that started in the Bronx, which is in New York, by the name of Neighborhood Benches, also co-founder of Never Be Caged um, and a member of the RRC, which is the story that boosts collaborative. So, so just to give you um, a picture of where I come from, um, what my experiences are, and um, how I come into this work. All right, so I grew up in this development, which is um, in New York City in the South Bronx called Andrew Jackson Houses. Um, during the time when I was born, I was raised, I was raised in a community that experienced substance abuse, that experienced violence, um, and that was disproportionately impacted in a variety of ways based on systems who have been set in place to oppress um, individuals, um, people of color. Um, so as, as I grew, as I've learned more about myself, more about my community, um, I, I was a victim of violence, um, shot in the neck. Um, during my teens, I was, um, I grew up in a community that I believe violence was the only way, um, who couldn't verbally, verbally express their feelings because there was so many things going on. Later on, I realized um, where this all stems from. Um, within that same time, I experienced my first arrest. Um, coming home, um, well, um, returning to a supermarket um, from packing bags. Um, packing bags is something that young people do uh, whenever they wanted to earn an honest buck by, from their community, they would receive some type of tip. Um, so on my way from a supermarket, I was arrested because officers raided the building. Right, so be, because of those two incidents in my teens, um, I was angry, I was frustrated, um, I was lost in many ways. Um, and at that time, it was hard to explain um, what I was upset for um, based on those experiences. So, of course, as a teen, I started acting out. I started um, engaging in things that I may have not engaged in if I had a different experience um, growing up. Um, in addition to that, um, in addition to, 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 to that, I also um, have a disability of uh, which is a speech impediment where I would where I would um, stutter 
right? So it was very difficult for me to get some of these things out um, and ways to express myself where I was comfortable enough to dive deep into what was some of the things that I experienced um, and what it was that I wanted to do with my life. So um, during the time when um, I was shot in the neck, um, the school um, wouldn't give me uh, elevator pass. So all these different things um, accumulated um, and held me back, which led to my choice of dropping out of high school at, at the time. Um, prior to that, straight A student, uh, um, straight straight A student, you know, um, attending art and design, accepted to 12 different high schools. Um, until that moment um, where both I was impacted by the criminal justice system and violence. I'm speeding up a bit where, where I started recognizing some of some of the things that I could do differently. I also started understanding that I had to find a way to peel back these layers. So because I acknowledged that, I knew that I had to do some work around myself as well as work um, within my community. So that led me to return to school, um, study undergraduate, um, study um, masters, and then started working in a field where you have reentry, where you have um, youth development. And I started learning different things from schools and from the work in the field. But it wasn't until I ran into some young people that reminded me of who I used to be when I was younger. Um, and at that point, I said, I have to not only peel back these layers, but I have to return to a place where it all started if I wanted to really, really heal. So being, being, being able to understand that I had to return to the place where it all started led me to acknowledge some of the underlying issues that I was faced with. So I wanna um, be able to show you this image um, where, where, um, where when I returned to my community, um, which I mentioned to you, the place where first, where it all started, um, I had to revisit that space as I resigned from, from the work that I was doing in the field, just to be able to comb through a few things. Rochelle is sharing the screen, this image with you. Um, and this is me in the field, right? So on top, you have the older generation, which is the generation that I come up with, the younger gen generation, um, which, which happens to be a lot of the children of the, um, of the older generation that came up with me. And this is me having a different type of conversation with both groups, right? One generation, second generation, and then us actually putting it into practice we see a younger generation of young people as we're standing over them, talking to them. And not to forget that there was also things going on in the community around substance abuse, around um, police violence. Um, so we also started having conversations with police officers, community members, um, government officials, just to show them that these are the things that the community is talking about. What I realized in this practice is that if you want to properly heal and you want to really look at the restorative practices, it has to be a way of living. It can't just be something that you do nine to five. If you're really focused on conferencing, peace, peace building, um, you have to model change behaviors in order to build communities. So, so, so at Neighborhood Benches, this is the things that we focus on. We focus on how is it that you put something into practice on a constant basis, right? So model and change behaviors, which equals the building of community. So that's what I started doing throughout time. And I not only learned about myself, but I learned about the harm that I caused the community and allowed the community to work with me as a collective to fix things that we have, that we may have contributed to um, that caused harm and caused the the, um, the constant interruption in our process to grow as individuals. So these pictures show the act of us having these difficult conversations and showing us and, and, and also showing you how we started working to fix those things, um, starting with ourselves. 
And being able to do this and invite other individuals outside of the community, such as police officers, government officials, being able to invite them into these conversations and introducing them to the work that we're doing, it opened up a gate, right? And that gate was having them acknowledge that, that we're trying to do something different, but also introduce them to the restorative justice, the restorative practices, the healing process. These are things that they never thought of. They just assumed, well, you know, well, these, these are people correcting their harm or correcting their wrong. But it was a larger conversation that needed to take place. Not only are we on the land, which are considered stolen property, but we're also on a land where young people are impacted um, and, and injustices are taking place on a constant basis. This is a community where young people experience this on a day-to-day -day basis. How do we start repairing that, talking about healing and talking about restorative justice practices other than talking about the criminal justice system taking a stand and correcting our wrong? We have to play out the community and be a community in the process. The way I was introduced to this work is when I was going to, um, when I was, um, when I was in um, graduate school, um, I had I had a younger guy um, who was heavy heavy in in restorative justice who pointed out to me the work that I'm doing um, as he wanted to learn about what I'm doing the work that I'm doing how was restorative justice. He said, "You did not know this," so I started learning more and more about it and started incorporating it into my work. But at this time, of course, I was doing doing this um, work, but not able to actually connect the two. Sometimes we need individuals to be able to identify those individuals that's, that's actually living our lifestyle, that's practicing the restorative justice, and that's practicing these different things that's talking about healing. Um, many times we have individuals who are doing it, but we fail to acknowledge them and um and bring them over bring them across that that line that divides us and in these pictures that's what you're seeing you're seeing me bring individuals over that's actually doing the work that's talking about healing talking about how how they've been been harmed and talking about how they want to do more to improve themselves and their community um and i think that's really important if we're talking about these different things that's talking about repairing that's talking about transformation these are the things, if this is what restorative justice is, then we have to put it in a, put it in to practice and it have to be a lifestyle, the same way we would take up anything else like a lifestyle. Um, and that's what we're doing on a constant basis. Um, and the relationship with RRC is, is, is that reminder of what it is that we, we are set out to do and how do you utilize the practices and the support of other individuals that's doing the work, if not in the same, but in similar ways. Um, how do you incorporate that practice into your day-to-day -day work? So thank you. All right, yeah, thanks, uh, William and Nicole. And um, yeah, I think one of the things that, that what William just mentioned in terms of, um, you know, not knowing not knowing that what he was already doing with his team and neighborhood benches could be called restorative practices or that there was this thing out there that was called restorative justice um, and that people are s sort of setting out to do from that from that starting point right that you take a tr training and you learn about it and then you go and you find a community to work with and, and, and William's story was really kind of truly about the roots, you know, having come from a community that he had already recognized needed that kind of healing through his own experiences and because he is part of the community um, and then kind of almost retroactively using that restorative justice language for it. Um, and, you know, people in our, our groups are doing this work in, in very different ways. You know, Nicole's working in the city, in the school system, and um, in, in very structured ways. And, and William is doing these processes um, more kind of like as sort of the fabric of his own life in the community. Um, 
various ones of us are participating in different kinds of um, uh, movement-oriented meetings in the city to try to increase the use of the practices. Um, and, and generally we see our role, in addition to just researching what we're interested in, to be kind of uh, anchors for the work, to be able to, to say um, that we stand firmly on the original values that are ultimately about interconnectivity um, and that that's, that's where we come from with everything that we're doing. So I wanna tell you a little bit more about how the project has evolved before we then move into just fielding questions and whatever it is you're interested in. And Nicole and William um, jump in also if there's anything else that you feel inspired to say as um, I share about our process together. So, um, so we, we, we got together, it was a little bit interrupted. I was actually on maternity leave last year. Um, and so our project took a pause during the year. So it wasn't really a full, um, a full year to work together, but for the months that we had in the first cycle of our work, what we, what we focused on was really coming up with our question. And we did that through these iterative cycles of learning, through coming back to questions, working them over again, teasing out what seemed to be the commonalities amongst all of us in terms of what moved us. You know, we wanted to find something that really felt like it was our, uh, we had energy around it, energy enough to stick with the exploration of that topic. And so a lot of our conversations really rotated along these themes around healing, about back to the roots, like we've been talking about, about our, our experiences and perceptions of, of the misalignment between the principles of restorative justice and the way that it's practiced through structural limitations and, and, and uh, a, a lack of depth in, in integrating the practices to one's own life. Uh, we talked about our own lived experiences and lifting those up as legitimate forms of knowledge um, along with you know literature and um, and standardized trainings but also just our own everyday practice experiences and lived experiences as uh, people from underrepresented communities or sometimes under resourced communities we talked about language um, also a lot, just in terms of how people talk about this work and um, what, you know, um, we actually had a conversation about this not too long ago, William, Nicole, and I around the word marginalized because we, were, we, we, weren't, um, we weren't feeling um, that that was the, the right word to use, that it really captured the experience of how we identify that it that, that sort of relegates to a sideline or a victim or a victim or a passive state. Um, and so, you know, ultimately um, feel, feel more accurate in talking about ourselves as coming from underrepresented communities. But we had a lot, we've had a lot of conversations around um, also the use of words and, and how we describe our work, um, and those were places where we found common ties with each other. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but this is just to give you a quick view of the types of questions that we were workshopping, that we kind of came up with along the way. Um, you know, what is the harm, where is the harm is a big one that relates so much to what you've just been hearing from Nicole and William around, um, what harm are we talking about exactly? It's one of the critiques of restorative justice is that it focuses too much maybe on the interpersonal and on the minute, on the tip of the iceberg of a much bigger structural issue that um, cannot be resolved within the framework of a circle. And sort of many practitioners ignore that, that bigger context in which the harm is discussed within these circle formats or other restorative formats. Um, so, wanting to explore lo location of harm, you know, and how we talk about what the harm is. There was a lot of energy around this question around what did auntie do, which is sort of shorthand for us around what are the real roots, like what came before. 
what's already happening in communities that that constitutes restorative. Um, so we've looked at different um, questions also in terms of their stability, their how solid they were as research questions for us, um, and 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 kind of vetting them through through this this questionnaire for ourselves, you know, as we came up with them and narrowed them down, um, wanting to think about what problem does the question seek to address? Why is it significant? What are the implications of discovering answers to this question? Is it clear and specific? Is the answer or are the answers genuinely unknown? Who else has worked on this? Uh, questions that are familiar to you uh, if you have done research and that we kind of workshopped collectively within our PAR group, um, thinking about what other resources we would need to really be able to understand our, um, our topic well. And again, this, this went for both groups. The one in Guatemala also went through a very parallel pr process. And we haven't really brought the groups together in part, it's time constraints and language barriers. I am from Panama originally, and I come from, um, you know, I, I speak, I'm a native Spanish speaker, so I'm able to facilitate the Guatemala group and provide that bridge. Um, and ultimately, um, our aim is to bring the groups together for some sort of a day-long exchange um, of some kind, and we've brainstormed different ways to do that. but. Um, uh, it hasn't it hasn't yet happened in a very definitive way other than me kind of reporting back and forth and sharing ideas back and forth. Um, but as I said, we're going to present at an at the ACR conference and I hope that we'll be able to have some preliminary joining with the Guatemala group at that time in preparation because we'll have some participants from Guatemala in that session. Um, so uh, like I said, there was really a lot of kinship that we felt from the outset, and um, and one of our participants who you know had spent some time in South Africa r really um, you know educated us around the ideas of sawubona and ubuntu, these South African native concepts around sawubona, meaning we see you or I see you and Ubuntu, I am human because you are human. I think these were really the sort of anchors for our, our work and the feel of our work together has been very much about uh, honoring the humanity in each other and wanting to carry out our practices in ways that recognize um, that humanity in everybody that we interact with, regardless of labels of any type. Um, and wanting to ensure that uh, the field itself really upholds these, these values as original and essential um, around our interconnectivity. So um, we kind of um, narrowed down questions to three main questions toward the end of our first cycle of work together. Um, this what did auntie do question was one that kept coming up for us and one that we thought about working around with a possible project being focusing our, on our communities of work to look at the pre-existing practices that held restorative values or effects um, and see how those can uh, retroactively, you know, reinform the ways RJ is currently practiced. And we thought about doing this through interviews with people who have historical knowledge within a community um, and, you know, sort of the elders of communities who have seen them go through many stages and something that, and, and William's work, for example, you know, he's talking about the different generations, so that would be a really tangible project. Um, and thinking of, of indicators and measures of restorative in relation to, um, in relation to what already was. Um, Another question that, that popped out, you know, that really came to the surface as important was, what is the effect of personal or historical trauma in the work of RJ practitioners? And we had a lot of, a lot of 
conversations around the personal experiences that that we've had um, and you've heard some of that through William and Nicole talking about their their background and stories but just how our own personal stories influence the work that we do and that the two are not are not separate um, and that that would be a project of, of a group self-reflection to look really try to delve deep into whether known conscious traumas but also try to discover perhaps unidentified traumas intergenerational historical traumas that we have been subject to that play out within our spheres of work um, using reflective practice journaling perhaps bringing somebody from the outside to conduct a sort of deep exploration with us in a therapeutic way around him manifestations of conflict in our lives um, those are those were just some ideas that we had thrown out and then another big question that we had thought about was um, what's the effect on us and on our participants of the misalignment between our understanding of values of restoration and those carrying out the work. You know, this misalignment idea was really important, um, kind of a frustration that many of us have experienced existing in different workspaces around restorative justice and sensing that there are folks out there who, for whom it is, it really is like a nine to five and <laughs> I do it in this setting, but I don't do it in this setting in my personal relationships or in my work relationships. Um, and a, that a possible uh, project around that would be uh, our own self-reflection in those mainstream RJ spaces. We all go to meetings all the time with other practitioners, pr practitioners professionals, leaders in the field. Um, conduct interviews or dialogues with dominant, you know, quote unquote, voices of RJ in the city. And, and sort of document how we have felt as a result of that. Um, and I actually, you know, I haven't shared this, but I had a recent meeting with um, some um, sort of more high profile leaders in RJ in, in the US and all of this came up for me. You know, I, I was really, it's something I want. I want to be able to talk about at our next um, at our next group meeting. But the 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 sense of myself as a brown person, as an immigrant, as a woman whose voice isn't as valued as somebody who um, is uh, used to being in a more assistant sort of role. All of these things really came to a fore in this meeting, and I found myself having all these sort of internal conflicts, recognizing that I didn't know where I belonged in the meeting. You know, I didn't have a sense of my own identity and what code I needed to switch to in the meeting. And, um, and it created a lot of static interference. Um, and I think that's something that we're not alone in, or I'm certainly not alone in, when many spaces are held by white identifying uh, leaders in organizations. Um, that's something that I've recently written about for a book called Colorizing Restorative Justice, which I encourage everyone to look out for if you're interested in these topics around, um, it's, it's written by uh, contributors, practitioners of RJ, um, who identify with being people BIPOC in some way. And so, um, recounting really personal experiences about doing that work within these colonized spaces. So ultimately we settled on, um, just to sort of wrap us up in this part and start a conversation, we settled on, sorry, looking at that middle question and looking at the effect of personal or historical trauma in the work of RJ practitioners in part these questions are not totally separate, right? They all sort of feed into one another and relate to one another. And, um, and we thought that it was important to do a personal reckoning of ourselves in order to try to build accountability within the field about for others to do that personal reckoning um, and recognizing that there are always these historical, intergenerational, and personal traumas that exist in us that we are bringing into these spaces that are already so riddled with 
trauma, you know, when there is pain, there's some history of trauma, and that it is the responsible thing to do for each practitioner to walk into that space if you're going to hold it in an honorable way to have done that work for ourselves. And so we wanted to really do a, a deep dive into that to be able to describe what um, are the ways in which um, those inherited traumas have uh, inhibited or benefited our work in different spaces and the ways that we work with them um, and ways in which we can come up with that, that, we can, that we can support our communities of practice in learning how to um, raise awareness of those internal traumas and what they bring into the space. Um, it's also, we chose this because for the period of time that we have, and this is our, um, our current timeline, we're starting now in September, uh, delving into the question. We're meeting bi-weekly for one and a half hours each time. We're rotating in terms of who's the learning facilitator and bringing outside people on occasion who know a lot about the topic of, of historical trauma or, or intergenerational trauma to speak with us. And we're um, gonna spend September to March really going deep into the study, uh, also doing pairs reflection work, continuing to do our talking circles, listening back in on our conversations through recordings and kind of pulling out salient themes and experiences. And then April and June, the goal is to integrate our findings, to draft an article collectively. Um, and that would be, you know, um, co-authored in the spirit of PAR by all the members of the group and start to decide about presentation outreach venues. And part of this is to comply with, you know, a small grant that I have to do this work, but the grant was written in order to comply with the ultimate goals of the project, which are really to uplift the voices of underrepresented practitioners. So, so having, um, influence on the thought leadership and on the conversations that are happening about restorative justice and thinking about tr strategically what are the places uh, where we need to get our voices out. Um, and then the idea is that in June we would submit an article for consideration and start to formulate uh, the next year's action plan, whether that is taking some other aspect of this question or starting on a new question altogether there may be a change in participants or it may be the same group, you know, we'll see as people go along. Um, but this part is about these cycles of learning. So whatever, whatever we are coming up with over, over the next year in our study and, and analyzing and self-exploration will be built on and will generate a whole new set of questions that we'll then use for our next cycle of work together. Um, and we hope that this can also be a model to be used for other communities of practice everywhere, you know, as a way to have practitioners take ownership um, over our own learning about ourselves and about our work. So I'll uh, end it there. Um, this is our website. Um, so we do keep that updated with news about what any of our members is doing. Our contact information is there as well. So feel free to get in touch with us if you want to know more about uh, what we've done or what we're up to. And um, yeah, we'll open it up for, for questions and conversation. Thank you all. Thank you all for a very powerful presentation and, and, and some great work that you're doing. I, I, there's a number of questions in the chat box, so I may just start with one of those, but others feel free to either, you know, raise your hand or chime in as well. Um, uh, I, I just, the other thing I'll say, just I'm glad you, you put those questions down. The middle question about collective historical trauma I was, I'm, I'm fascinated with that and have been writing on that. And, and, and so I was glad to hear that that's the one your group chose, you know, in this PAR uh, format. I'm, I'm, I, and I, I was thinking as you were speaking, even some of the language you were using, um, you know, one resource, and maybe you've reached out already, is, is the Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience folks at EMU, Eastern Mennonite. 
Um, they have a couple of workshops they do and numerous trainers. In fact, David Anderson Hooker, who was our early speaker, is one of those trainers. Um, and, and so maybe that leads really nicely into uh, Pushpa's question in the chat box, I think is quite interesting. Um, she says, how far can restorative practices go? I think this is a question that David was also asking in his keynote talk. Can you speak about what else needs to happen in organizations and institutions? I ask as schools are pushing for restorative practices on racial justice issues without much idea of RJ or, R or restorative practices. So I'll open that as the first question and please. Yeah, thank you. I, I want to invite Nicole or William, if you feel moved to answer any question, to please jump in and I can, all, I can also do the same. But is this a question that speaks to either of you to answer? Um, I mean, I have, I, I don't know if there, there's a specific answer. Um, that I would say is is the one, the golden one, but I, I would say that you can take it as far as people are willing to commit to um, and as far as you build the capacity for it. So it can go all the way um, or it can stop really short um, just based on commitment and capacity. And I think um, that organizations and institutions and schools um, those communities just need to be really brave um, in terms of creating a space that can um, build and strengthen relationships as a base in order to get to whatever the, the kind of restorative goals are. Um, but the bravery in terms of having the difficult conversations and um, really being, um, being willing to to undertake this as like a complete mindset shift um, in terms of moving from punitive ways of, of being together and being in relationship with each other to more restorative ways, um, practices and approaches. And really um, the mindset shift in terms of like taking restorative justice out of pockets of, um, I say pockets like I'm thinking about schools and, and a lot of schools initially were saying, well, let's bring in restorative justice to kind of rethink discipline. But it's so much bigger than discipline and you can't even really effectively impact discipline without thinking about like all, the whole culture um, in terms of like the relationships that we have with each other. Um, and how we are together, how we are with each other within our relationships. So that's what I mean by like taking it out of the pockets and thinking a lot bigger about um, culture shifts within our communities and within our organizations. Um, and being willing to just go really deep, to be self-reflective, to listen, um, which is, is such a huge challenge within a lot of these spaces and within a lot of implementation work um, and to really want to address the harms that have existed that are still ongoing. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's, it's easier said than done saying like, be willing to go deep and be brave and address harm and listen it sounds like, okay, we can do that. You know, people think they can commit to that, but once you start the process, you realize how hard that is and how threatening it feels for a lot of people and how um, power dynamics are, are really challenged and people start to get really, you know, kind of unsafe feeling about like giving up power, um, letting students take over, for example, um, like these kind of fears that come into people's minds that are really just barriers to doing the really deep work um, and taking it all the way. So that I, I would start there. I think um, I'll just say one more thing, sorry. I think also just being um, 
when thinking about like starting an implementation or restorative justice implementation within any type of community, um, just being able to really like co-plan that and to like co-create what that looks like. So nobody can come in and like impose restorative justice or restorative practices within your space. Um, but you have to be really um, intentional about like co-creating an experience that fits the culture, that examines the culture, that um, accounts for past and existing cultural kind of norms and harms and um, future cultural goals um, in a way that like everybody's really a part of the process intentionally and thoughtfully. Maybe following up on that, unless there's other comments, I'm, I'm kind of curious having started a, a, a restorative justice kind of learning community at my university and trying to build community partners into it. I'm curious like how that process, I know you, know, you, you talked about PAR, but how that process worked in terms of seeding that responsibility and empowering people and, and kind of creating that learning community can oftentimes be very difficult. Um, and then I'll just add to that, maybe you, you can kind of follow up as well. One of the questions that's on the chat box as well from Russell about the Zoom world, now that we're in COVID, you know, how does that change that dynamic? How does that, what adjustments need to be made? Yeah, so um, that's definitely one of the tricky parts, I think, of doing part or what I'm learning along the way, you know, now having spent um, a few years really focused on it is, is, is where, where does the facilitation motivation part end maybe is one way to look at it by the, the, um, the learning facilitator for me in, in this case and, and where does the ownership and and motivation <laughs> need to begin for the particip the other participants and it's a little bit of a mind shift you know also that's required just in terms of um because that's what it is it's something that's it's non-traditional form of research and so for me the question of positionality has been really central because i i i both am a practitioner i'm somebody who existed uh, for many years in spaces of, of practice and in conceptualizing programs and working in direct services. And then I've now stepped into the academy, you know, with that experience and also with all of the consciousness and requirements that are upon me in, 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 in sort of fulfilling those expectations within forums um, in my home institution and elsewhere. And and so I'm like, I'm holding all of those things at the same time. And I think what's been um, most beneficial for me, at least in this project, and I don't think that it was as successful in the, in the last one in working with the mediator groups, um, but has been really uh, seeing myself as another participant, you know, in, a, in truly that participatory way. And it's easier for me to do in this case because I also am going into the question with the same amount of knowledge as everybody else. Whereas the, the last project that I worked on, I had an abundance of research about the topic that we were setting out to study. And I necessarily <laughs> stepped into this more kind of teachery role, you know, some of the time that um, was, it, it created a dynamic in which I necessarily was the leader of the group and kind of uh, created more directionality than, than I felt was ideal for something that was a truly democratic process. Um, so, so this 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 project was really starting at the beginning of a participatory aim with with no agenda about what we were going to study so we really began and i think restorative practice led themselves to this we began by creating community amongst ourselves first and foremost as people who 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 had experienced similar things in our practice worlds and um, 
and then from there contributed equally around topics that really mattered to us. And I think anytime you get people together to talk about things that they're genuinely concerned about versus getting them together to talk about uh, you know, your own agenda of questions that you have about a particular thing, um, there's gonna be a natural more taking of the reins and, and ownership. And you know, I still, and William and Nicole should should speak to this too, how you know, like how you guys feel in terms of being owners of this process. I think I try to turn the reins over as as often as I can, um, and sometimes explicitly remind everyone that the the decisions are in all of our hands. Not it's I'm not in charge, but but I do because of my position do the bulk of the, the 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 work you know in terms of um coordinating and organizing and so there is a lot more that 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 people look to me for in terms of that and keeping the structure of our project together but in terms of the actual conversations um we always make make a point to do check-in at the very beginning of our meetings and this hasn't changed with zoom we always met um which was maybe an advantage in this COVID transition is that even when we were able to be in person, Zoom was always an option if you couldn't make it to the meeting. So some people were always Zooming in anyway to our meetings. And sometimes we had our whole meeting on Zoom, just in terms, you know, New York is a big city. It takes a long time to get from A to B. So just to make it easier. Um, and yeah, you guys should speak to this too, William and Nicole. I, I personally haven't felt a lack of, um, you know, a significant loss of connection with you all because we are in the virtual sphere. Um, and I don't know if that's because we're all more used to it, um, but I think we've been able to still do our talking circles, you know, hear about each other's lives and care about each other even even online well well hey. Go ahead, William. Um, so so when you're looking at for one um i want to address the connection um with rrc um in most spaces you're either you're either identified as a pain or you're identified as the healer, right? Um, coming into RRC, um, you're identified as a part of the process to move forward, right? Um, and I think that's missing in a lot of conversations and a lot of groups um, that come together that's trying to work on moving the needle forward, right? Um, when you look at um, how a person at the question we lost that, the connection there you still there William? Guys? you're back okay, you're back. back. Mm -hmm. okay so so when you look at that that's missing a lot in a group when it comes down to building a relationship building a community um if people are seeing you as the pain or the healer or they're seeing you as part of the process like um in addition to that it's just like when you're looking at a person that enter a room with a suit on compared to a person in a dress down on what type of respect and what type of acknowledgement is is generally observed when that individual step into the same room with a different out outfit on, right? Um, and then diving into the question, because it's related to this, diving into the question about how far can RJ go, how far can a practice go? When you're looking at branding and you're looking at messaging, right, it's based on who could carry the message, right? When you can identify someone who can properly carry that message, that message could go a long way. Whether it's on a shirt, you're talking about restoring the justice or restoring um, 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 healing or even just the restorative practice or the restorative justice concept itself. Um, having someone to carry that message, whether it's verbally or visually, um, that carries a lot of work. You, It's kind of difficult to, to speak to the choir when a choir is already 
researching and practicing this work. You have to be able to carry the message into the communities that actually need the support to move that agenda forward, right? Um, and that's what I look at. That's what the team look at. We're looking at the ways that we can identify questions that's going to move that conversation forward so someone else can tackle the question along with us. It's not about us coming up with the answers and thinking that that's the end all. It has to be a way to have that difficult conversation with individuals who are trying to identify that process to move forward. Yeah, I, I'll just add also that um, just in terms of like logistics around the Zoom world, um, it still works. It's still effective. It's still impactful. Um, you know, as, as facilitators and practitioners, we're learning new kind of tools and tricks every day on Zoom. But um, just being really thoughtful about creating an, an experience that mirrors in person as much as possible um, through things like, you know, breakouts and through um, making sure that you're utilizing equity of voice and that everybody's engaged, present, part of the process, um, on camera, even um, that you're putting a speaking order in the chat, whatever you have to do to just kind of like mirror the in-person um, activities really helps. But um, I've been able to do Zoom facilitation and implementation with like small groups and groups of 200 people um, since we've been virtual and, and it's possible, it can still work. So that's just a, a logistical note. Can I add something to that as well? Um, thank you for that, Nicole, because that was, that was definitely important. Um, nothing changed um, on Zoom besides the physical contact. Um, if we're looking at the younger generation, the younger gen generation been using technology when school was still in before the pandemic. Um, they've been using FaceTime, they've been using um, um, all these different apps, um, house party to communicate um, virtually. So we're really stepping into a space that's already been utilized. We just have to um, critique it and, and, and master it so that we feel connected still. Um, and, and being at things, things are, are opening up, we have to practice um, making some type of formal visit um, to where we can connect that. But this should still remain in practice because this is what today's world bring us. It brings us this type of technology where we can speak to people that's in a whole nother country, that's in a whole nother state and, um, and have those different difficult type of conversations as if we're sitting face to face. Um, I think that's important um, that people acknowledge that, that this already existed. We're just being um, um, forced to utilize it a little more, but this technology existed um, far beyond um, what we may have been thinking. Thank you guys for, for sharing your story with us and your work. Um, I, I just popped in the chat box. I hope people will join us for October because I think a lot of what was discussed here and the, the storytelling aspects of what was discussed here will come back up. And that was our intention as a conference planning committee to really have these, this conference continue on in ways. So many of the conversations we're having here, I hope will reemerge in the October and then into November as well. Um, so again, remember to, to, to get on and register for another ticket, but thank you guys for sharing. I think we're, we're, we've come to the end of our time, but certainly not to the end of the, the, um, excitement of some of the work you guys are doing. So I, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to come on and share your stories. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. We can clap. <laughs> <laughs> Virtual clap. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks for being here on a Saturday and during your meeting. Uh, it was good to share. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye, everybody.